Hey gang, I am Joe Edelman and welcome to The Last Frame Live. Generative fill is the big new buzz phrase for AI and photography. And we're gonna break that down a little bit tonight. We'll talk about some of this AI stuff. I'm realizing that people are really kind of freaked out about it. So let's try and have a calm discussion and open our minds to some possibilities. Uh, I was going to do a you know little update on all this new gear that's come out. I'll mention it, but we're not going to get deep into it. Uh, and in fact, I'd be happy to even pass on a shot breakdown tonight and jump right to the Q&A. There's this generative fill. This is a big deal. So look, if you're watching live, you know the drill. Please leave me a note in the chat. Let me know who you are and where you are watching from. And if you're watching the replay, no worries. Leave a comment down below the video. Let me know you were here. I'm taking names. Also, already tonight, who we got here? We got FN89 here from Washington. I haven't seen in a while. Calvin's here in Maine. Uh, Lynn up in New York. Uh, Pete in Tulsa. Robert down in New Mexico. Joe Dussel in Vista. Alan, uh, California, that is. Uh, Alan in Virginia. Uh, Robert Redman over in the UK. Lane is here from Indiana. Uh, Alexi just snuck in here from Boston. All of you are part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries. In fact, I actually need to go back and check that because I think we're up at about 112 now. But uh, folks that want, tune in to watch The Last Frame every week. And for that, I'm going to work really hard in the next 60 minutes to help you with your photography. Of course, it would help a lot more people find out about The Last Frame if you could do me a solid. Hit that thumbs up down below the video. The more thumbs up, the more YouTube recommends this show to other photographers. And of course, while you're down there, feel free to go ahead and hit that share button. Let your photography friends know that we are streaming live on YouTube right now. Facebook, Twitter, they're definitely the fastest way to get the word out. Uh, I also just dropped that link, lastframe.live, in the chat window for you, and it's in the show notes below the video. So um, just some really, really quick updates. Uh, I will be next week, in fact, uh, one week from now, right now, I am going to be in Austin, Texas. I will be at Precision Camera and Video, and I will be doing probably the most favorite presentation that I have ever done. And this is a brand new updated version of it. It's called Don't Be Afraid to Suck. Your photography depends on it. Uh, this is all part of Precision Camera Spring Expo that they do at their main store in Austin, Texas. Uh, by the way, an amazing camera store. If you've never had an opportunity to be there, it is huge. Okay. Uh, and then on Friday, next Friday, June 2nd, in the afternoon, 2 o'clock Central Time, I'll be doing uh, a demo, bold and colorful fashion portraits with LED lights. We're going to use the Nanlite Pavo tubes, uh, some really, really intense colors. And it's going to be a 45-minute demo in their studio classroom, but then we're going to set up out on the store's main selling floor, and we have two really, really awesome models. I'm very excited about both of these models. Um, you're going to be able to photograph them yourselves and do this crazy cool color stuff. I've got a couple really neat styling ideas that we're going to put together with them. It's going to be a lot of fun, so don't miss out. And then the last piece uh, of my self-promotion, June 6th. You don't want to miss this. If you shoot people, heck, if you shoot landscapes or any of that kind of stuff, this talk applies. But the bulk of what I'm going to talk about, it's people photography. And that could be not just models like I do, but portraits, headshots, weddings, you name it. Shoot prep. Great photography requires excellent preparation, okay? Um, it is a two to two and a half hour, usually runs just about a full two and a half hour presentation about how to make sure you are giving yourself the best possible opportunity to get great images anytime you are doing a shoot. So uh, let me go ahead, by the way, let me share these presentation links really, really quick here. There is the shoot prep link, uh, and then also the Spring Expo from uh, Precision Camera. I'm gonna put this link in here for you. Um, so I hope to see some of you in person um, next week at Precision. And then of course, I hope to see all of you for the shoot prep presentations coming up on June 6th. Don't miss it. So, uh, as I mentioned, 
I was originally going to go ahead and do a whole bunch of gear stuff tonight because there's been a bunch of big releases like in the last, well, two weeks because I skipped last week, right? Uh, I mean, if you've got a spare six grand laying around, because we all have that, right? Leica announced the, the new Leica Q3 that steps all the way up to a 60 megapixel CMOS sensor with 8K video. And I got to tell you, I love their marketing message. Quote, like a Q3 mixes both classic and modern with a timeless design, unquote. It's a box with a permanently attached 28 millimeter lens to it, right? It doesn't even have a viewfinder, but it does have a miniature effect mode for those who really like those shallow depth of field images. I mean, come on, really? But seriously though, beyond the Leica thing, a lot of folks are really excited. Fujifilm announced their new uh, XS20, which is the next one in the line from the XS10. Uh, also, they've got a pretty cool looking eight millimeter um, super wide lens. It's a 3.5. Uh, Nikon, of course, uh, in their words, they say that their new Z8, it's both like a D850 successor for the, on the DSLR side and a baby Z9, right? Um, Canon's also got, you know, kind of a, a consumer type camera they release. So if you're interested in that stuff, yeah, let's go check out the blogs, right? So generative fill. This is pretty amazing stuff. So unless you are a person who's been living under a rock and avoids social media at all expenses, uh, and even avoids the news, you have been hearing people talk about all of this new generative AI with Adobe Photoshop. So all of you should know, by the way, that if you are a current Photoshop user, you can get the beta version of this. It's, it's not in full production yet. It's not a full release. Uh, do understand that pretty much all of this AI technology it requires people, people like me, people like you, people like the next guy with a camera. It requires people to use it and use it and use it and use it. It's the kind of thing where the only way you can teach it effectively is to break it, right? So they make this stuff available um, for beta testing. And it's worth downloading. If you have an Adobe Creative Cloud account, uh, it is worth downloading the beta and giving a try, and I'm gonna show you a little bit of it. Um, but I wanna talk first, before I show you everything it does. I'm gonna give you my opinion, right? You guys all know how I feel about opinions, but um, a lot of people have been reaching out to me in the last 48 hours, maybe a little bit more, you know, because this AI conversation's been going on for a while. But ever since these Adobe announcements this week, I've been getting message after message after message. What do you think about this? What do you think about this? Is this going to change photography? Is this the end of photography as we know it? Like, what's going to happen? How is this going to impact professional photographers? Yada, 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 yada. And you know what? Look, I'm not making fun of anybody. All of these are very legitimate questions. And they're all very legitimate concerns. So when I say I want to give you my opinion... It's really coming from one place primarily. And that one place is, I firmly believe that we all just need to take a breath and relax a little bit. I think that there are a few factual statements that most people agree upon. AI is going to introduce a lot of new things to the photography world. It already has been, both in our cameras and in our software. So that's a factual statement. And look, we're just in the beginning of this AI stuff, so we still don't even know where it's going to go, right? It holds a lot of possibility. Also, factual statement that we can make is the software, the AI, is not bad. It's not doing bad things. It's not taking business away from people. It's not misleading people. It's not doing any of those things. People do those things. So look, will there be some problems with this AI software and how it impacts society? 
in terms of truth in advertising, truth in news and documentation? Yeah, there will be, for sure. But that's not the software's fault. That's people that do that kind of stuff. In fact, just this week, the stock market took a hit briefly, fortunately, because of a news story that started circulating on Twitter with a picture that claimed the Pentagon in the United States had been blown up. And the picture wasn't even a building that existed in Washington, D.C. So people read the headline and started sharing, like, oh my God, right? Is that kind of stuff going to happen? Yes, it is. But does that make AI bad? Does that mean we shouldn't have it? Does that mean we shouldn't consider it? No, not at all. So that being said, here's the advice that I give you before I even show you what this can do. I have talked in the last couple of days. In fact, just before I came on here live tonight, I did a community meetup with several members from my Tog Knowledge community. And they were kind of at both ends of the spectrum, right? There was a person who's been dabbling with it and thinks it's kind of cool and is, you know, basically waiting to see where it goes. And another person who asked about it with the idea that, well, I've been doing things this way. What's wrong with what I'm doing? The short answer is nothing, right? So here's the advice that I give you, especially if you think it's bad or if you're worried about it. Here's how I break it down. And you're all intelligent people. Consider this and use this as you see fit. I think, number one, you do need to take a hurry up and wait mentality about where does AI impact us all. Now, a hurry up and wait mentality about where does it impact, it just means kind of that final decision of like, I like it, I hate it, I'll use it, I'll never use it. It's too early to make those decisions. But at the same time, so now listen close because I'm going to talk out of the other side of my mouth, I do think that as photographers, so remember the dictionary definition of photographer is a person who takes pictures. That's it. So I don't care what you shoot. I don't care if you photograph people. I don't care if you photograph landscapes, bugs, doesn't matter what. I do think you should pay attention to it. Now, how much you pay attention to it yet, certainly that's up to you, but I think that that attention should be a little bit more than casual. But here's why. I don't bring this idea to the table with the idea that you should be essentially looking over your shoulder, like worrying about it, or wondering if it's going to replace you, or wondering if it's going to make your gear obsolete. No. I think you should be paying attention to it because I hope, I really do, that somewhere in the mix of what you enjoy photographically, I hope that the word creativity plays a large part in that mix. And if it does, that is why you should be at least paying attention to the AI as it develops. Simply because AI presents potential. AI presents possibilities. AI is a new creative tool. For some, AI will be a completely new way of creating, period. For some, it may replace their cameras or the need for a camera. For others, it will become an addition to their camera. I, I will tell you that today, as I sit here talking to you, that's the category that I'm in, that it will become an addition. And I'll show you some examples of what I'm talking about, okay? But, you know, I, the best example I can give you or the best analogy I can give you, I use this one a lot because everybody understands it. We've all heard of dinosaurs. We all learned about dinosaurs in school. We all learned about what happened to the dinosaurs. Don't be a dinosaur. Right? You don't want to become extinct. Whether you're a professional, whether you're an amateur just having fun, whether you're a person who enjoys being creative, doesn't matter. Okay. When this conversation of AI, I don't know that it'll ever be done, but but as it progresses, 
Maybe you're a film shooter and it's going to have no impact on you. But who knows? Maybe you're a film shooter who then scans your files and realizes, I could do some cool stuff to these creatively once I've scanned them. Maybe you're a film shooter who wants to be a purist, okay? One thing you will not hear from me, you will not hear me judge a film shooter for wanting to be a purist. You will not hear me judge a digital shooter for wanting to be a purist, okay? You will hear me judge those who are just so close-minded that they don't even want to really understand it or understand its potential. Because for me, that's a person that's not really interested in creativity. Um, I have only had the Adobe beta, the Photoshop beta on my machine for probably about 36 hours so far. So I'm a little over a day into it. I have spent probably about four hours with it of actual locked in, undivided, uninterrupted use. Um, I will tell you this even before I get into it. And by the way, the, the, I'm going to show you a couple things that it did for me. But then I'm also going to do a few things live because I want you to see how good and how bad it can be. It's far from perfect. So yeah, it's exciting, but, but relax. It's not a game changer yet. Believe me, Adobe's onto something here and it's cool, but we're not all the way there. And that's okay. It's early, right? Uh, so by no means I, I, am I, you know, there's nothing negative to Adobe there. Like I said, understand that the only way we're going to be able to develop AIs is the human interaction. They need that. How are people actually using it? How are people conversing with it to make it better, right? So, um, but I have found a couple scenarios where it's done amazing things. I've found a couple scenarios where it hasn't worked at all. I have had one or two scenarios where it has inserted it, a human being from another picture, not one of my pictures, some other picture that it got into my photo. Obviously, that's a fail, right? Um, I've had a couple situations where it really had a hard time working with the select lines that I gave it and actually left white lines in the image. Um, but overall, once you get a sense of what it's able to do, and keep in mind, I'm saying what it's able to do today, right? Um, it's pretty doggone amazing. Um, I had someone ask me in my Tog Knowledge community meetup a few minutes ago, um, you know, the comparison with compositing. It's like, well, what's wrong with compositing? There's absolutely nothing wrong with compositing. I do lots of compositing, which is kind of like a, a human-based AI, right? I'm finding a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and I'm piecing it all together. Uh, what this is able to do is, one, do it much faster, to draw from a bigger knowledge base uh, and bigger visual uh, database. Um, and three, for that matter, do things that I would never even think of doing, which is pretty doggone amazing, right? So um, let's take a break. Let me show you a couple things. Um, and understand that part of what happens here with this is that every time you... Um, open up a picture and work on it. So you can have a picture and it does something really cool. If you don't save that and you just close the file and then you come back an hour later and open it up, it's going to regenerate whatever you ask it to generate and it will not necessarily give you the same results. So I'm going to switch my screen over here to my second display and I'm going to open up an image. Uh, let me just reset a couple things here really cool. Oops, let's grab that. Reset this. Okay, so you'll notice there's kind of a new pop-up toolbar that comes up down here underneath your photo when you log in, which, by the way, this is also in the current version of Photoshop. But to be able to do the AI, you need to work with um, Photoshop beta. So this is an image. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to select the grass down here on the lower left. I'm going to purposely leave a couple of those dandelions in there, right? And as soon as I finish the selection, that box is going to come up. It's going to be a little bit different. And here's that famous two words now, generative fill. So I'm going to click that. And what it says to me, I know it's really small on your screen. So for those of you that haven't seen this, let me read it to you. It says, describe what you'd like to generate or feel free to leave this blank. And then it does have in brackets, English only. So, so this is a low angle shot that I did of this dandelion with the sun behind it. So I'm going to say, you know what? Because... 
I'm not a big one for wild creatures outdoors, so I would never take this picture, but I would say, let's add a snake. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter. You see the little pop-up box? So it's basically taking my image, it's sending it back to Adobe. The AI is not happening. I don't have the whole database on my machine, right? It's reprocessing this image and it's gonna give me three variations, but I want you to look at that snake. How cool is that? But maybe I don't like that variation. It gives me that variation. Or it'll give me that variation. None of the three is perfect. But it's still pretty doggone amazing, right? So here's the first one. The only real major flaw on this one is this one weed. It kind of bent over and dragged it out here. There, there it is originally. There it is there. That was kind of weird and awkward, right? Uh, second one, overall pretty good. It kind of does crush the dandelions a little bit, but still, eh, it's, you know, we can get away with that. I could totally live with that. And then the last one, yeah, that dandelion there is just kind of weird behind the snake's head. And I know it's hard for you folks to see it uh, on the small screen because it's a, a screen capture and video, but um, the stakes don't look a thousand percent real. They look really, really impressive, but not a thousand percent real. I firmly believe though, based on what I'm seeing, they're gonna get there real soon. I, I mean, I kid you not. But let's just say, for whatever chance we decided, hey, let's um, see what else it'll give me. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna hit the word generate again. I left the same directions in there. It's gonna generate for me three new ones, okay? And so we'll have six to look at and we'll see what we get. So, okay, so the new ones, that one's kind of interesting. Uh, that one's very similar to one of the first ones, but it got rid of that folded folded uh, piece of weed, which I like that. So the, I'm kind of digging that one a lot. And then that one, ooh, it's almost like it's gonna turn to the camera. So I'm kind of digging that, but you know what I'm gonna do now? Um, and I haven't tried this yet. So we'll see what it does. And you can see, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take this dark area down here and Click generative fill, and I'm gonna say add a field mouse. See what it does. Maybe we can make the snake hunting for the field mouse. I have not tried this. I have no idea what it's gonna give me. So we'll see what comes up. Oh, that's a kind of big mouse. So that's not working. Um, yeah. I think the mouse is a little bit bigger than what I hoped for, but you know what, here's the cool part. Like let's say I was gonna go with that. I could just go ahead on this layer, hit free transform, and I could go ahead and shrink him down. I'd have to do a little bit of work with the weeds, but so you see, not perfect, but eh. So here, let's do add a, we're gonna make it a small field mouse and let's see what it gives us. We'll make, see if that makes it any better, okay? Ah, so there we get a head. Yeah, so now it's just kind of giving us the heads. There, there's the worried one looking at the camera, right? So obviously, really cool, not perfect, still has a long way to go, but very, very impressive, right? So now I've got a question here. Let me do this question, and then we come back and we'll we'll take a look at a couple more of these and see what it does. Uh, coast to coast imagery, greeting from Palm Coast, Florida. It's been a while. You warned us several years ago that AI and videography would have a major impact in the coming future. The question was, um, how would we adapt to it? Yeah, and so, I mean, and I did talk about that. I've actually talked about this stuff for, for quite a long time. In fact, um, Coast to Coast, probably when you saw me, if you were at like um, FCCC, if that's where you saw me speak, um, I talked a lot about the idea that we would have software that would do culling for us. Um, and indeed, that's, you know, that's here. Uh, and I've been talking about that for the best part of 10 years. So, I, you know, I, I think for me, um, how we adapt or how I'm going to adapt to it first, but then I'll, I'll talk about how I think some other people should be um, considering it, okay? So, um, uh, Eric, it is not, um, sorry, it is not an automatic update because it's beta. What you do is open up your Creative Cloud app and it will be there in there as an option and you can go ahead and download it.
Okay. Um, so anyway, back to coast to coast and uh, how do we adapt to it? For me, I am eagerly exploring it to see what I can do to enhance, recreate, additionally create with existing images that I've already made, right? Um, and then with images that I'm going to shoot, let's say the next couple of months, I will definitely be looking for ways to use it um, with shots that I'm planning. I have for a couple of weeks now, I haven't shared any yet, I'm still working on them, um, but I have been experimenting with Mid Journey and creating some backgrounds. I know a lot of photographers have been taking some of the images they've shot and loading them into Mid Journey and having it redo things. Uh, I did some of that too, it's pretty cool. The only reason I'm not um, really pursuing that yet is because once it's been through the AI, it has an AI feel to it, kind of like those snakes did, right? Um, it's amazing, incredibly impressive, but for me, I, it's got to get to where it, it really looks real. Um, a good example, and folks, no politics, so please everybody behave. Uh, what was it, like last month when Donald Trump was in New York for the court hearing, when he had to go to the courthouse, there were a whole bunch of pictures that made the rounds from AI of like Donald Trump in handcuffs and Donald Trump in a prison jersey and that kind of stuff. And look, if you were scrolling through Twitter and you saw that picture, it looked incredibly real, but real tiny. Right, so if you blow it up to kind of full size and look at it, and I don't mean pixel peep, I just mean like look at it, you know, a full size image, you could immediately tell it was not a real photograph, right? But the problem of it is, is that's one of the bad things that can happen when you're looking at them as small, they're very convincing, right? So for me, the idea of uploading a finished picture into like mid journey and having it reprocessed and that, you can do some really cool stuff. Uh, if you wanna see a photographer who's doing some of the most amazing stuff ever with AI, but it looks like AI, it's got an AI feet, feel to it. Google the name Tim Tatter, uh, or go to Instagram and, and better yet, look up his profile. Uh, I'll type it into the chat here so you all have it. He's a New York based photographer. His, he's been doing a lot with AI for a little while now and this stuff is just insane, uh, brilliant. Because understand that the key to that kind of AI work that you see him doing, it's the prompts. It's what you're telling the computer that you want it to give you back. Um, so it's not like he's just sticking something in there and going clicking, oh, that's cool. No, 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 no. There's actually quite a bit of skill that's um, put into a lot of, of what he's, you know, he's generating, right? So, uh, so for me, it's, um, you know, creating backgrounds, it's seeing what I can do to kind of rework some of my image, which I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Um, but let's talk about it just for the sake of it. Let's talk about it from a business standpoint for a moment. Uh, I had this conversation, again, a few minutes ago with my Tog Knowledge community. I think, let's say headshot photographers, as an example. There is a lot of opportunity soon, not today, but soon for headshot photographers to not fight AI or AI headshots but to embrace them. Now I know today there's a lot of headshot photographers that would probably be like, shut up, you're crazy. No, I'm not. Cause I'm not talking about it costing you any money. I, I'm actually talking about you making more money on your headshot sessions, right? So already we have apps where you can load up a picture of yourself or better yet several pictures of yourself from different angles. And the app will come back and it will generate 10, 15, 20, 25 different AI headshots of you. Um, I've tried a couple, none that I've been really impressed with. In fact, I remember the very first one I tried, you had to upload 15 headshots of yourself in all different angles and lighting, right? And then it spits, it was going to spit back like I think 20, 20 headshots. I had to pay like $7, right? But it was worth it for the experiment. But the very first image that I open up when it comes back, it's, it's me as an astronaut. It's like, what? Like, I, I, it's not what I was looking for, right? So... What I'm referring to is as we fine tune this and the pictures no longer look like AI when they really look like images, okay? 
Then there's an opportunity for a headshot photographer to realize that most of your clients come to you, and especially in this day of social media, people want to be able to change their pictures often. And, you know, they're only going to be able to afford to pay you for basically one headshot, okay? Now, look, there's always exceptions, but let's use that example. So somebody's going to come to you and say, look, I need a new headshot for my LinkedIn page, whatever. Okay, fine. So, you know, you're hopefully going to charge $300, $500, $1,000 for that session, and it's going to be amazing. And maybe you're even going to give them two, three looks, et cetera. But you could then go ahead and feed those images into an AI. You, the photographer, do that. So that means you're going to subscribe to an AI, right? And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna say, I will give you this one finished headshot, but I will also give you 25 AI headshots based on that first one. And you're going to charge a premium markup for those 25 AI headshots, which these systems are capable of kicking back to you high resolution files. Again, to do that today, those 25 images are gonna look like they came from an AI. You can get high res, but not super high res. So the process is really not functional yet, but we're getting really close. And so that's just one example, right? That's just one example of how professional photographers would be able to use it. Let's face it, it already goes without saying, right? Because we can already kind of do it, but it's gonna be even faster, even easier. You know, maybe you have a wedding group picture and you need to take somebody out of that group. You're just gonna be able to like click on that person and have it go and you know, it'll take seconds, right? Um, Pete's got a comment here. He said, I can see it um, as being immensely useful if I'm doing a food shot or a carafe of olive oil and I want some olive leaves in the background. Uh, I didn't need to you know, hunt them down. I exactly, I mean, being able to add in elements, pieces, all that kind of stuff. I, I think there's literally um, tremendous possibilities. So let me, let's just see here, we'll, we'll experiment. And again, I've tried this on a bunch of images already. To be clear, you can go through and do it a second or third time. It's not always gonna give you uh, a good result or the same result. So I'm gonna show you some um, finished versions first, right? And then we'll do a couple live. So. Here is an image, this is the image, you may have seen this, this image is on my website, that's the image. That's the image that I shot, it was a vertical image, right? Now, you may have also noticed if you follow me that the overwhelming majority of my photographs today in 2023 are horizontal, overwhelming majority. Uh, that is kind of an evolution that I've gone through in the last 10 years because the majority of my pictures wind up appearing in a video. And just like you see, Oops, sorry, uh, it would help if I showed you the picture, wouldn't it? Just like you see on the screen, you see those white borders? I hate the borders, right? Because this was shot as a vertical picture. So that's basically the full frame out of the camera. So for me, this is a great example of a shot where it would actually be really hard to remove her from the background because of how heavily backlit it is and all the glow and then that little bit of stray hair. But Photoshop was able to give me that. Now, I want you to notice a couple things about what it gave me, okay? Notice it didn't take the easy route and just mirror. These are two completely different sides. Number two, look at the depth of field and the bokeh and the texture in the background and look at how it replicated that throughout the whole background. So it had to analyze that image to get a sense of what is the depth, what is the texture, everything about that background, and then expand on that. Tell me that's not amazing. That's I, I love that image. I very likely will wind up using that image for teaching purposes, okay? Um, here's one where it failed, but it could be fixed easily. I got a little bit of a white line going up there, so healing tool, I could knock that out, and that's not bad at all. Here's the third one, kind of the same thing. It has some problems with these edges from time to time. Not bad, but that first one, truly amazing. Okay, let me uh, let me open up another one here and show you that it was a, a finished one that worked. Yeah, this is one. So this was another shot. This was a square image. 
Okay, that's a, a, a shot that I use in a, a lot of my classes and, and teaching. Um, so I've expanded it out to 16 by nine and going ahead and let it run the fill to see what it will give me, right? And it gave me a couple versions. There's the first version that it did. There's the second version. And there's the third version where it even made the tree uh, on the left thinner. You can see over there that the tree, whoops, let me get under the, that's it. The, the tree there is, is thinner, which is quite impressive, okay? Now, just to give you an example of what I was talking about. So the way that I did these, let me, let me clear that. I'm gonna come back to here. Um, the way this works is super simple, especially since I'm not doing a piece of the picture. Uh, I'm just gonna select that box, select that box, right? So I've got both of them selected. Right down underneath here, I'm gonna click Generative Fill. And in this case, I don't need to give it any direction. I just wanted to expand it and fill it in, so I'm just gonna click Generate. And again, just like you saw before, it's gonna upload that image, and it's going to give me back three more options, okay? Also, it's worth noting that if you, depending on what time of day you do this, if their servers are busy, busy, you will get back um, a message that says servers are busy, et cetera. Uh, so you may have to try a couple times, okay? So there's version one, there's version two. You see, it's, it's having issues with these lines right now. Um, and I found before it was kind of hit or miss. I'd go five or six tries and it had those issues and then suddenly it'd go away. So I think part of the problem at this point is also server load. But for me, I really like that first batch that I did. Um, Pete asked, I can see your photo extensions, raw, JPEG, et cetera. Does it only work on JPEGs or raws or both? Uh, Pete, it actually works on both. Um, I happened to pull in a bunch of JPEGs um, that were just images that I already had saved out because I can access them faster. That's all. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would encourage anybody, if you're really gonna work with this, uh, go ahead and, and work with your, your raw files. Um, it, that would just, it would simply make more sense. Um, let me see here. Here's another one, which I thought was just incredibly impressive. There is my original image. There is the extension it created. There is a slight hard edge here through the water, easily fixed with a healing brush. And there's a slight black line that's created here in the trees. Again, easily removed with a healing brush and it's taken that image and it's turned it into uh, a 16 by nine, you know, and just for the sake of it, let's try something kind of ridiculous here. We'll see what it does. Uh, I'm gonna select that area, add, uh, add a person in a lawn chair. Add a person in a lawn chair and we'll see, whoops, would help if I spelled right. Add a person in a lawn chair. And we'll see what it comes up with here, okay? Um, I, I've been finding that the more common the images are that you are thinking about, the better it does. Yeah, so that one kind of failed there. Eh, that one is actually blended really, really well. Of course, it's completely ridiculous, but um, that one actually blends really well also, uh, but the person's actually kind of really wonky. So again, some of it really, really amazing. Some of it actually horrible, okay? But what's incredible about this is simply the amount of potential that this, this has. So this will be an example. I have not tried this one. This is a picture of my my oldest grandson, let's go ahead and see if we can turn this into um, a 16 by nine format and see what it does here. Okay, whoops, I went way too big. Let's try that again. There we go. So I'm gonna extend this out and then I am just gonna use select tool, select both sides and hit generative fill and then generate. I'm not gonna give it any directions. I'm just gonna let it go ahead and fill that in and we'll see what it comes up with.
And also, gang, Carlos, I saw your question. I didn't miss it. I'll get to that in a minute. And folks, if you have any other questions, now's the time. Start typing, okay? So actually pretty amazing. It ran into a little bit of a problem down here in the bottom where the house is because part of the challenge is, was, this is what threw it off, I tilted the camera a lot for this shot. So that's why you notice the, the roof of the house is off. Um, so I could probably, let's try this just for the sake of it. Um, I'm not going to tell it anything, and I'm just going to hit generate and see what it does there, okay? We'll, we'll see if it takes that out. So I've given it no directions. I just selected that spot, and I want to see what it's going to do for me. Maybe a complete fail. We'll see. Look at that. So two runs through the AI, and it's giving me three very functional. That's the best one right there, okay? Um, Come on, gang. That's amazing, right? That, that, that is just straight up amazing. So again, look, I enjoy photography. My why, I told you to always remember your why. And I, if you've ever seen me talk at some point in my conversation, in that presentation, I probably talked about remembering your why because it's so, so important. We have so much information coming at us today. We have so much technology available coming us today. We have so much, you know, social media and trends and all that kind of stuff. And if you chase all that stuff, it takes all the fun out of this completely, right? So first and foremost for me, my why in photography is access to interesting people. First and foremost. Second on my list, very, very close second, but second on my list is creativity. It's the opportunity to create, excuse me, when I was, that was horrible, I apologize. Um, I've been having really rough uh, heartburn. So um, when I was in like grade school, I remember first and second grade in particular, and we started doing art classes. And you know, it's crayon art classes, right? But it's art classes. I loved the idea of being able to draw because it was taking something out of my brain and I was putting it on paper. But there was a problem. I sucked at it, like horribly. I had a hard time making stick figures look like stick figures. Like I just, I can't draw. Can't draw to save my life. And I even have horrible handwriting. Like I used to get through school with functional grades for my handwriting, you know, grade school, but my handwriting's horrible. Today, at this point, I can't do cursive at all. My signature is a scribble. I, you know, print block letters. I have a horrible handwriting. So a big part of photography for me was that ability to take that visual concept and be able to kind of manifest it, to make it something that was real, right? This takes that a, a whole step further. So, I mean, to me, I find it tremendously exciting. Um, there's a lot that's going to have to be flushed out here, gang, right? So, again, this is really early. This is like a, a new toy to play with and to kick around and see what it will do. But there's a lot of legalities that have to be flushed out. I mean, here in the United States, and I'm sure it's all over the place around the world, but here in the United States... Um, if you go to a website like Midjourney or Dali and you create an image, you're not able to copyright that. Copyright laws don't protect a computer-generated image yet. So, of course, the question now is, well, this image is partly a photograph that I made and it's partly a computer-generated image. So then the question becomes, do I own the copyright to this? Do I not own the copyright to this? Does Adobe share half of the copyright if I use this image, right? So actually the terms of uh, use for the Adobe stuff yet is that you can't use it for commercial purposes. So you're not allowed to make money with it yet. One more reason, we don't need to be panicking. All these articles that you see on the photography blogs and all the YouTube videos, the world is ending, photography will never be the same, yada, yada, yada. Look, we can go back five years and from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, photography will never be the same because during that year, new cameras came out, new technology came out. It happens every year. So the whole photography will never be the same thing. We've been here, I've been hearing that since I first started in photography in 1971. 
And you know what? Every time I've heard it, they're right. It'll never be the same because the world evolves. How cool is that? That's cool. It really is, right? So again, my hope, my sincere hope for all of you, because I know that you're all passionate about photography, pay attention to this. Learn a little bit about it. Dabble with it if you can. Believe me, if you're not an Adobe user, don't run out and, and you know sign up for Adobe Creative Cloud just to do this. It's going to be in other programs. There's already iPhone apps. There's going to be tons of variations of it. So, you know, if you don't use Photoshop, fine. Read the articles about it. Understand what it can do and be aware because really what you're doing is you are making sure that you are aware of tools, new tools that you can use to be creative, new tools that you can use to help you manifest an idea in your head into a tangible, you know, actual photograph, right? So again, that's really, to me, that's where we all need to be on this because it is big, it's exciting, and it's opportunity, right? All right, so anyway, that's my take um, on AI. And, and look, in all seriousness, any of you that are, that are listening right now, um, if you have an opposite outlook on it, share it. I'm not gonna make fun of anybody, but here's what I want you to promise before you type your comments, right? If it's just a dismissive, oh, that sucks thing, no, keep it to yourself, I'm not interested. But if you feel that I've overlooked uh, an important element or a really, really important concern, Share that. Let's talk about that. Because believe me, if you have the concern, other people have the concern, right? And I don't have all the answers. Not at all. I'm definitely, I'm on the open-minded side. I'm anxious to see where it's going to go. That's cool. But I, I very well may have overlooked some things. So I'd love to know. I'm always open to a good discussion, okay? Uh, and while any of you are typing, and if you have any other questions, we're down to like 12 minutes, so type in here. But Carlos, I promise you that I would deal with this question um, how do you focus for eyes on a tripod? Um, so Carlos, I'm going to make some assumptions. So in the meantime, while I'm kind of making these assumptions, feel free to type in the chat, um, what kind of camera you're using, right? Uh, and also, uh, I'm going to make assumption number one. So tell me if this is wrong. I'm going to assume that since you're talking about focusing for eyes with a camera tripod, you're talking about shooting a, a portrait. Okay. Um, most cameras today, aside from like, in, well, actually you can do it with an iPhone. So yeah, most cameras today, you can move the focus spot. The focus spot is designed to be moved, right? Uh, a lot of cameras have like a little toggle on the back that you just push the toggle over uh, or you've got the, the round dial and depending on which direction you push on it, you move the focus spot. So you move the focus spot to the eyes. That's step number one, right? Depending on what camera, Carlos, type in your camera model, Brandon model. Um, I just saw that he said, yes, it is a portrait. Uh, the other thing that you can do, which um, I started doing when I was shooting with Olympus because it was the first time that I had a camera with eye tracking autofocus. In fact, Olympus is the company that brought that technology to market. They created it, right? Um, and it wasn't a choice that I made. I actually got lazy because it was so good. When I was shooting portraits on a tripod, which I routinely do because I shoot tethered, I just didn't bother moving the focus spot because as soon as I half pressed the shutter button, the eye tracking was going to kick in and the focus spot would go right to an eye. And with the Olympus cameras, I had the ability to say, pick the nearest eye or um, pick the uh, left eye or pick the right eye. Okay. Um, Carlos, what I need to know. So Carlos just typed back, but I need to move the camera to place the spot. Uh, I don't think you do, Carlos. I'd like to know what camera model you have. So could you tell me make and model? Right, that would that would help me a lot, okay? Because um, without knowing your camera, I can't really give you a solution because I don't know what features you have available. So I need I need the rest of that information, okay? 
Let's just see. I got something else in here. Did I get that information or not? Um, that's a 50 millimeter lens. What kind of camera do you have, Carlos? Camera, make and model. So is it Canon, Nikon, Sony, and what model camera is it? I don't care about the lens. I need to know what, I need to know what camera, okay? Um, so uh, anyway, so with the eye tracking autofocus, I didn't have to, you know, bother moving at all. And kind of the same now with my Sony cameras. Um, I've tried to be more disciplined in the studio and I move the focus spot somewhere to my subject's face, but the eye tracking does all the heavy lifting and I don't, I don't stress over it. Um, even with my Sony a7IVs, which again, not everybody has the tracking capability, um, I use the combination of the tracking autofocus and the eye tracking autofocus. And I almost never move my focus spot anymore, but that's a basically a permanent setting that I have set up on my camera. Um, so that, um, you know, I, I don't have to ever really worry about it at all. So um, I haven't gotten a response back from Carlos here. Hopefully Carlos is going to tell us what, what brand camera and what model he's using. Um, and I'll be able to kind of give you a response there. Um, cause Carlos, if you're moving the camera and then recomposing shot, that's called focus and recompose, um, focus and recompose when you're photographing people is really not a good idea. And I know there are people that do it. Uh, and I very, very much discourage people from doing that simply because, you move and your subject moves. So now, of course, if you're using a tripod, the camera's not moving, so that's a good thing, but your subject moves, right? People just, you know, they can move back and forth, in and out, just in breathing, right? Um, so if you are going to do focus and recompose, it's not a bad thing to do, but you wanna make sure that you're shooting with enough depth of field. So I would encourage you, make sure you're shooting at like, you know, F8 as a minimum. For that um but again i'm waiting and i'm not getting an answer here so sorry carlos if you if you can give me an, an answer about what camera make and model i can totally help you out here but that's the thing i need to know um because literally all i'm going to do is i'm going to google your camera make a model i'm going to see what what focus capabilities it has okay um i got time for one more question if anybody's got anything if not i'll tell you what i'll do since there's no more questions in there let's go back let me I'm going to switch back to um, Photoshop and we'll play with play with another image here real quick, okay? Let me just set this up so I see if Carlos's message comes in. So, um, so actually, here's one that I played with also before where it gave me kind of mixed results. So, so I'll show you here. So this is this is the original photo. This is an image that I did on a photo walk at Photo Plus a couple years back. And I, I also wanted to try it with black and white with really stark, um, you know, uh, tones just to see what it would do for me, right? Um, so I, I honestly, I, I wasn't expecting a whole lot of success with this one. So the first result that it gave me was that. And I found it really interesting because it found these kind of buildings to put on the ends that, that don't really match what she's standing in front of at all, but it kind of works. I mean, it's, if you look at how it blended it together, it's pretty doggone impressive, right? But it, it's like two completely different vibes, right? So then the second version it gave me was this one, which is kind of okay. I really found it impressive that like all the shadow detail in that, it kind of imagined all that shadow detail and filled that in and then all this. So that really pretty amazing okay but then the last one which i actually really like it took the texture from the wall here and it replicated that texture on the sides absolutely amazing right um so just really really cool stuff um in all likelihood you know i would probably darken down this left side a little bit um but it's like, wow, that's, you know, adding a whole nother layer and kind of element um, to the image. Uh, let's see if we can do one more here. Pete, I see your question. When did you say you were going to be in Arkansas? I am going to be presenting at the Bedford Photo Expo 
It's literally a year from now. It's um, May 17th and 18th of next year that's in Little Rock. Um, so obviously as we get closer and as it comes up, I'll, I'll definitely give you, um, I'll share more details and, and let all of you know. So here's an image actually. Let's do this one really quick. So I've run this one twice now and I forgot to save it the first time, which was really stupid because I haven't been able to replicate the result or even come close. Um, so this is another one I'm going to expand the background, right? Just to see what I get. And I'm going to, just for the sake of, you know, experiment, we're going to give it a little bit of a rule of thirds thing here. So I'm going to move her over. Okay. Um, so I'll select that side, select that side, and I'm just going to go ahead and generate. I'm, I'm not going to give it any specific directions. We'll let it do its thing. And we'll see what we get. Okay. Uh, Cause again, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things I'm learning is that depending on how busy their servers are, you're going to get slightly different results. Um, so, ooh, that's interesting, kind of right out of the box, but I'm not digging that light green there. It did really, really interesting stuff over on the right here. Uh, and this one, the right side, again, looks awesome. That's still really wonky. Um, here we're getting better, but still not where we want. So let's go ahead. Let's hit that. And in the meantime, Carlos is telling me it's a 7D. So um, if I have any Canon 7D experts in here, Help me out with its focusing capabilities, but otherwise, I'm doing a quick Google search, Carlos, and we'll see if we can't get you the answer here. I would have to think that that camera allows you to move the focus spots. Um, that's still generating. Okay, so that's cool. I'll come back here. Let me get to the index on this, and it's downloading. I got stuff downloading all over the place here. Okay, so... Um, Section four, selecting the autofocus and drive modes. Okay, it's page 84 we gotta get to. So Carlos, you need to look at page 84 on your camera manual. Um, I'm scrolling down here to get that page. There we go. So let's see, focus, uh, one shot AFX. Oh yeah, you can move your focus spots, Carlos. You can move the spot and not have to go back to the center. Um, all that's there. So you, yeah, and you have a toggle. You can move it manually, Carlos. So um, yeah, you you need to go and look at your camera manual. Start on page eighty four, and page eighty seven has the information you need. It's called selecting the AF point manually. Okay. That's that's what you need. So page 87 in the manual. Um, there you go. There's the reminder. Page 87. That's going to get your answer, Carlos. Um, so yeah, you can absolutely do that. So all right. Oh, here's the next round that it gave me. So that one's kind of interesting. You see, it's not perfect. The first time I did this one, it was amazing, and I didn't save it, which was my dumb move, right? Um, so like left side's awesome. It filled that in really well. That bar is just really awkward. So that's the piece for me that we'd have to play. Let me, we'll, we'll go one more time and see what it does. Um, and we'll give it a shot here. So again, if you have Adobe Creative Cloud, I would encourage you, you know, pour yourself a beer or something to drink, load a couple images in and just play. Just get a feel for what it does. But oh, there we go. Now look at that. So look at that. There you go, gang. Pretty cool. So I need to clean up that, that line. But look at how it brought the shadow the rest of the way out. Okay, yeah, see that one, complete fail. Um, that one, again, still does good on the right side, but uh, yeah, that one's actually very doable. Pretty amazing stuff. Look, at the end of the day, you know, we are blessed to have all these tools and all this cool technology and it's just like anything else. You know, you always hear me talk about there are no rules. There are no rules. There are no rules, right? It's going to be the same with all this stuff. The people that allow themselves to think outside the box, to experiment, to imagine, to dream, what could I do with this? Those are the people that will do the most creative things with it, right? Um, but there's nothing that says you have to do any of it. So bottom line is have fun. Don't worry. Stay aware. Remember your why. In the meantime, 
please remember, you've got less time ahead of you than you have behind you. So don't waste any time. Pick up that camera and go shoot something because your best shot, it's your next shot, gang. Adios. Have a great week.